Well, hello, I'm Martha Nance, and I'm the course director for today's uh, sessions. Um, um, this is your opportunity to ask um, our panel anything you want. There will be another um, Q&A session that's really directed at the research presentations at the very end of, of the day. And some of the speakers during the course of the day will also have uh, Q&A um, opportunities at the end of their presentations. Um, but but we have 15 minutes now um, for this group to take any questions that you have for us. Um, let me have our panelists introduce themselves. So uh, we'll begin with you, Andy. Yeah, hi, I'm Andy Duker. I am the uh, director of the uh, HDSA Center of Excellence at the uh, University of Cincinnati uh, Gardner Neuroscience Institute. And I'm a member of the uh, planning committee for Family Day today. So really excited to have the chance to talk to you guys. Hi, my name is Jamie Hatcher Martin. I am uh, involved in both research and in clinical care for Huntington's disease and a big proponent of telemedicine and care for our patients. And hi, I'm G. Bang. I'm an assistant professor of neurology at Johns Hopkins, and I'm the clinical director of the HDSA uh, Center of Excellence here. So nice to be here with you guys, and please type in your questions. So I forgot to emphasize the way that you ask us questions um, on your screen. There's a little purple box that says questions and answers. And there's a place in that purple box where you can type in a question uh, and then hit send. Um, and then we'll see that question. Um, as a participant, you don't see the questions that other people have asked, um, but we will see them. So go ahead and type in a question. But I have a couple of questions just to, that have come in just to sort of get us started. I know Dr. Hatcher Martin, you're, you've been very involved with telemedicine um, and a lot of our patients have been utilizing telemedicine over the last year and a half. Do you think that's gonna continue to be a significant part of care for people with Huntington's disease in the future? I think absolutely. I mean, we, you know, we've been excited about it for a long time. And I think as unfortunate as the whole pandemic was, I think it really accelerated the use of telemedicine for not just Huntington's, but for, you know, all of our patients with neurological conditions and other issues. But it's really high, it sort of jump-started a lot of um, some virtual clinical trials that we're talking about starting where, you know, maybe people who aren't as close to some of the academic centers may be able to actually participate in some clinical trials. And yeah. I think, you know, there's a lot of, of insurance and Medicare, things like that, and Medicaid that are starting to approve more telemedicine. So I think it'll continue to be a viable option for a lot of our patients, at least, you know, maybe not every visit, but at least to sort of pepper in between their in-person visits. Cool. Um, yeah, I think that'll really help people who live at a distance. Um, and I know that the, the Huntington Study Group is working on tools to um, develop virtual um, assessments. Um, it's, it's always a challenge to do a, a motor exam by video, even as we're doing this presentation. Uh, as I move my hands, I see them two seconds later. <laughs> so it's, it's a challenge doing a clinical exam by, by video, but we'll figure it out. I've been, uh, 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 I've been interested in seeing the inside of a lot of my patients' homes, though, which is, uh, I think, uh, a nice plus with telemedicine. Yeah. Yes, uh, I've met a yeah. lot of pets and, and babies and, and others. Um, but it also, I think, um, you know, without invading too much privacy, it gives us a sense of sort of what kind of challenges you might have in your home when we see what kind of things you have to navigate to get through things. Yeah. Um, and so I think that gives us an extra depth um, to, to our visits. And I know it can be challenging, uh, but I do think, yeah, as, as uh, Dr. Hatcher Martin said, you know, maybe not every visit, but if it's like a quick visit where we're just checking on medications to make sure you're doing okay, I think those also, you know, that kind of situation lends itself really well to televisits. So yeah. they've been working really well in that, that aspect. Yeah. Good. So keep those questions coming in. Um, another question is, you know, we're excited about research in Huntington's disease, but how do you recommend that we live well with Huntington's disease today, now? And maybe Dr. Duker, I'll start with you, and then and then the others can kind of um, add, add in after after he talks. Sure. No, I think it's uh, critical that uh, you focus on um, what you can do to to improve your quality of life now. And there's so many things that you can do. Ultimately, um, you know, visiting your doctor regularly, I think, is important uh, because we can help to, to guide you and give you advice about uh, uh, things that will be helpful for you. 
um, you know, developing a, a regular exercise program, I think, is uh, critical for Huntington's patients. Uh, there's so many different uh, opportunities for exercise. Um, and the level of exercise is not necessarily important. It's, it's the fact that you're doing it and that you're doing it regularly. Uh, and in the same way that you have to exercise your body, I've always counseled my patients that you have to exercise your mind. You have to um, not do crossword or Sudoku per se, but, but really interact with other people. Um, uh, it's those connections with other people. It's those conversations that keep the, the neurons active, that keep them connecting to each other. And that's um, really what helps keep you healthy. So those are some of the advice that I usually give. Um, Dr. Hetcher Martin. Yeah, I can say I I agree, and I used to, I always tell people, you know, it's not just right the the interactions with people and getting out in the world. It's not just the cognitive; it's the emotional. It's that you know that you can get, and especially with the pandemic the way it's been, you can become really isolated. So. Um, even if it's, you know, via a Zoom chat or some other sort of video conferencing, I mean, just really staying involved and, and communicating with people is, is really, really important. Yeah, I absolutely agree with all those uh, statements that, um, yeah, it doesn't have to be like a specific puzzle or, 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 you know, brain teaser you have to force yourself to do. Um, but just, you know, conversing with people and socializing, that takes a lot of, you know, uh, brain cell power too. So that's a good exercise for your brain cells too. Sure. And finally, knowledge is power. So coming to sessions like this, I think is, is, is yeah. important. Um, I have a question. Um, I, I indicated in my presentation this morning that there are a number of potential treatments being explored by researchers. And what's the bottom line? If I were to make an educated guess, when do you think we'll have an effective treatment? Five years, 10 years, 20, 100? And, you know, I, I've i been doing Huntington's research for 30 plus years, and I've had my hopes dashed more than once. Um, we've done an awful lot of studies of things that we hoped would make a difference, and it just didn't didn't pan out. On the other hand, we do now have the drugs um, on the market, the tetrabenazine and Osteto, the deuterated tetrabenazine, and another study looking at a similar compound called valbenazine uh, as a treatment for the chorea, at least the movements in Huntington's disease. So we, we've, you know, we've made tiny little steps um, in at least treating the symptoms. There's a whole host of medications available uh, to, to treat the uh, mood and behavioral symptoms. And there's work now to develop treatments that are specific for the cognitive changes um, in Huntington's disease. So, so there's work on treating symptoms. Um, you know, I think there's our, the big hope about, um, uh, you know, fixing the gene or, or cutting out, you know, let's use that CRISPR technique to cut out the gene. Um, you know, and then and then we had such a disappointing um, month of March this year when the two studies came out. There was so much hope, um, and and it just didn't work out. But uh, what I really promise is a lot of people working hard. There's there's almost more excitement, more enthusiasm in the research community about developing new treatments. In part because the first shots at the moon didn't quite work. And so we got to really redouble our efforts and work harder. I've I've learned not to promise any kind of time frame, um, because you know then your hopes could be dashed. Um, all I would say is we are part of your community and working really hard um, to to find uh, better solutions. I don't know if some of the other speakers have other ideas, um, um, but but I would just I, I would not promise a time frame. Um, another question, what about perdopidine? When might it be available? You'll have an opportunity to um, speak with some of the um, researchers leading studies like the um, perdopidine study. The, uh, there will be a whole session um, uh, devoted to the um, Roche, the Tom and Erson trial. Um, so specific questions about specific studies that are ongoing, you might want to um, uh, put off until um, until this afternoon and ask the, the uh, leaders of these studies. Um, uh, comment from uh, Tacey Fox. Uh, I was involved in the SIGNAL trial and watched the Vasinex presentation um, from Dr. Zouder, who's the, one of the leaders of that trial. And although the sort of initial news was that it was 
that the, the um, trial did not meet its endpoints. Um, there's a, as you look more closely at the data, there is suggestion that um, patients who were uh, sort of at an earlier stage in their Huntington's disease who had um, functional scores of 11 to 13, um, or I'm sorry, it was, it was the, the ones who actually were performing worse in the study actually did better on the drug. Um, uh, and study participants should be told about this and that Vasinex is looking for a partner to help do a different trial. So, um, you know, again, the, the, the um, results of that um, study will be um, published. Um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Bang or Dr. Duker, were, you, were either of you involved in the signal trial? Yes, our center was yeah. uh, involved in the signal. Yeah. Okay, and and what is your take on um, on the results and the sort of future, um, the potential for future studies um, of that drug? Yeah, you're sort of uh, waiting for guidance. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, it's always dangerous when you're doing a what we call a post hoc analysis, where you're analyzing the data sort of differently than you initially had intended to. Um, and so it, it uh, um, I think it's an exciting um, uh, opportunity and it is something that uh, we definitely need to explore further, but it, it's difficult to know how much to make out of it. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I agree. I think, um, you know, the, there's a potential for, for excitement or, or, you know, sort of more positive, potentially positive effects. But yeah, I think it's, um, you know, a little bit hard to tell with that um, sort of post um, analysis. Yeah. And Sandra asks, where can I go to find the latest research? What's going on in the pipeline? And um, a wonderful place to go uh, would be the Huntington Study Group website. Um, uh, I think there's um, uh, HDSA, I think also has HD Trial Finder. Um, Another place to get information about what's going on is a wonderful website is HD Buzz. Um, if you've never been to the HD Buzz website, I encourage you to go there. Uh, where else do you guys, um, Jamie or, or G or Andy, where do you suggest people go to find um, what's going on in research? Yeah, so there's also just the generic clinicaltrials.org. You can search by disease. Um, that might give you some trials that might be smaller, maybe they're not making, you know, maybe it's just a small local trial at a you know, university or something that's maybe not making the big news yet. So that's a great place where you can search by distance and everything else. Yeah. Yeah, it's clinicaltrials.gov. Gov. Gov, sorry, gov. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, what about treatments for cognitive changes? And I know Dr. Duker, I think your site is hoping to be involved in that study. Yeah, um, there's, I think, a number of uh, potential agents to hopefully treat cognitive changes in Huntington's disease. This is a major unmet need in Huntington's disease, honestly. We have treatments for the movements, we have treatments for uh, the behavioral changes, um, but uh, cognitive changes have been difficult. The medicines that we use to treat, like Alzheimer's disease and things like that, really don't work um, in Huntington's disease. So. Um, there are um, a couple that I'm aware of uh, different compounds being studied specifically for cognitive changes in Huntington's. And so um, the, the trials uh, are about, one of them is about to get underway and uh, um, hopefully we will get some answers as to whether it's helpful or not. Yeah, so and our the, side is also, yeah, thinking about, or uh, is um, looking into studies um, like that and um, Later this afternoon, we'll also have some sessions where um, those studies will be talked about in more detail. Yep. Good point. Okay. All right. Um, I think we probably, the, the other questions that I see are not something we can answer in um, 34 seconds. Um, so I think what we'll do is wrap up this session um, and go on. I think next, uh, coming up are, are some of the um, simultaneous sessions, the breakout sessions where you have a choice of um, two or three different presentations. Don't worry if you can't, you can't see all of them simultaneously, you can always come back and see them on demand um, tonight or tomorrow or next week. So if you miss a session, it's okay. So we'll move on to the next session. Thank you very much.
Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank bye, you. Bye.